Well, I have the top of the hour, so I say, let's begin. Let me welcome you. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, host, and your chief cat herder for the next hour. I'll be your guide to this conversation about the future of higher education. I'm delighted to see you all here. We have a terrific guest. I really am delighted to welcome Professor Carl Kapp. Uh, Carl is a professor at Bloomsburg uh, University in Pennsylvania who specializes in instructional technology. He is, uh, among other things, very passionate about gaming and I think about creativity in higher education with technology in general. So I'm looking forward to a wide-ranging conversation about instructional design and how we can use that to better improve teaching with technology. Let me welcome Professor Kapp. Greetings. Hey, greetings. Hi, great to be here. Oh, great to see you. I'm so glad you could make it. Welcome. So glad to be here. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. And, and so glad for all the, all the folks who showed up. Uh, great, uh, great crowd. Me too. Well, I think you'll find the Future Transform community is very thoughtful, very funny, um, uh, very perceptive, and we'll have all kinds of questions for you. But I want to start off with a couple of quick questions myself. The first is, when we introduce academics to each other, I find that we can often go on for some length. And the most economical way to introduce is to ask someone what they're going to be working on for the next year. So, you know, what topics are going to be uppermost in your mind and what projects uh, for you, for example, what, you know, book projects, teaching, administration, right. what does next year look like for you? So, so interest. So uh, my personal projects, I'm working on a digital card tool um, to create digital card games. Uh, I found, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's really interesting. I, I spent a few years ago, I, I did a, a 3d virtual game in unity and mm -hmm. um, so much overhead to learn how to play. And, and, you know, to me, Unity is like swimming, but, uh, to, you know, working in it, but not for everybody. But everybody's familiar with the card game. So card games are easy and simple, so I'm doing that. On on the university level, interestingly enough, Bloomsburg University is merging with two of her sister schools, Lock Haven and Mansfield. So our faculty uh, and our university are going through that merging process. So that's been and is and continues to be uh, quite a project. And I'm working on uh, a book, another book on gamification uh, with a woman from Microsoft. So they've implemented gamification and she and I are uh, putting down her thoughts. She, mostly she is putting down her thoughts. I'm assisting and uh, we're working on that book project. And my pet project for the, for the years, I've created a series called the unofficial, unauthorized, sometimes I call it unauthorized, unofficial, but either way, unauthorized, unofficial history of learning games. I got really interested in the past of, of learning games. Um, someone had posted somewhere that they invented something about games. And I'm like, I think no. And so I wanted to go back and see really when that started. And it was, you know, well beyond when they invented whatever they invented. So uh, it just got me really interested. So I'm looking into the Oregon Trail and I'm looking into war gaming and something called the Crimson Contagion, which was a tabletop exercise that actually predicted the pandemic um, uh, about a year ahead of time. Uh, really fantastic and interesting kind of topics. That sounds fantastic. I would love to see that. And in fact, uh, my students at Georgetown uh, working on gaming and education, we'd love to, you know, do whatever we can to uh, uh, throw things at you or to uh, you know, look at drafts. Yeah, no, that's great. I would, I would definitely send a link to, uh, the first four episodes. Wow, oh, terrific, terrific. Now, speaking of links, friends, uh, you'll see at the bottom of the screen on the left edge of it, there's a kind of tan colored lozenge shape uh, that says Carl Capps homepage. And guess what? If you click on that, it takes you to Carl Capps homepage. So if you'd like to find out more about Carl, if you'd like to get in some of his previous books or look at his classes or his consulting and workshops and his blog, it's all there. It's all there. Uh, Carl, that sounds uh, like a fantastic year ahead. Uh, what do you teach? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm teaching. So I teach. Uh, well, this summer I'm teaching a course in uh, instructional game design, and in the fall I teach. Well, my favorite course is I teach a course called Managing E-Learning Projects, and Ooh. in that course I uh, form students into teams or companies. I give them a mock request for proposal. Ooh. They have to then write a proposal, prepare a sales presentation, create a working prototype 
and then present it to our corporate advisory council. So we just, we do it twice a year. So we just had it in uh, end of April and we did it all kind of in Zoom. And um, uh, one of our graduates has a little studio downtown. And so he added a lot of elements there and we threw in some Miro to, to, just for fun and uh, mm -hmm. breakout rooms and uh, had a great time. Well, that sounds fantastic. Who gets to be on the corporate board besides you? That's fun. Actually, it's, it's, <laughs> Actually, I do very little when it, when we finally get to that stage. It's it's um, individuals who are uh, practicing in the field of instructional technology or are faculty in the field of instructional technology, nice. uh, primarily made up of our alumni, which is really exciting mm -hmm. because um, I tell the, I tell all my students, you're not done with this class till you come back and sit on the other side of the table. And so uh, we have a real nice um, kind of mixture of of uh, uh, fresh graduates, graduates have been out 20 years, mm -hmm. and uh, corporate people who aren't graduates, but who are uh, interested in instructional technology. So it's a lot of fun. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun. It, it, it really is. It's it's the reason why I went to Bloomsburg. So I was going only going to go to Bloomsburg for three years to check it out. And so like 20 plus years later, I'm still <laughs> there. <laughs> You've definitely checked it out. Uh, I have. I have. Well, we have a, a couple of questions that are just starting to come in. And, and friends, if, if you're just joining us, again, if you'd like to send in a question, you can do it from the bottom of the screen. Just click that question mark button or click the raised hand button to join us on video. Uh, and one of them comes uh, from, uh, let's see, this is from uh, Wendy, who asks, I'd like to pursue a PhD soon, and I hope to merge my loving of gaming and structural design. Any suggestions on where to check out in terms of colleges? Ah, that's a great question. So, uh, first of all, I always I always encourage anyone who's thinking about a PhD to definitely do it because um, there's no time like the present. It's really interesting. Uh, do it for yourself, though. Make sure you do it for yourself. So, in terms of programs, I think the University of Maryland had a, a program in game design, and probably the best known one there's my friend um david metcalf who is in and i want to get this right one of the florida universities is it florida states or is it florida uh let me i'm looking him up right now so i don't get it wrong but i already have got it wrong oh there we go um so he's in uh central florida uh, mm -hmm. which has a really good simulation and gaming program. So um, that's the one that I'm most familiar with, and that would be a really great one to, to check out. Our, my, you, Bloomsburg does not have um, a graduate program in uh, instructional design. It's only a master's program. Um, it's interesting. The state system of, of higher education in Pennsylvania has very few master's programs, or very mm -hmm. few doctoral programs. In fact, Bloomsburg only has one in um, um, speech and uh, uh, hearing. So, yeah. So that one uh, is a good one to, to start with. Well, thank you. Um, that's a really great direct and informative answer. And uh, uh, Wendy, I hope, that, I hope that satisfies. I hope it gives you some direction and good luck. Good luck indeed. Um, now we uh, so if you're new to uh, Shindig or to the Future Transform, that's an example of a, um, of a text question. So you can see it's pretty easy to ask. Uh, now let me see if I can bring uh, Dan uh, the Soda up on stage to uh, give us an example of a video question. It's Dan La Soto, excuse me, uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks. Hello, Dan. Hi, Brian. Hi, Carl. Hey, Dan. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, I was really excited about this conversation today. Um, I've got maybe two questions. How do you approach faculty that are, they have some preconceived notions about gaming, like it's a distraction from their curriculum. And then uh, also the challenge of those faculty uh, or, or maybe other folks that think of something in terms of gaming, but that's not, it's not really it's inherently boring. It's like too textbook. It's, um, you know, and, and students turn away from it because they know, you know, they're being tricked into some sort of just another boring assessment sort of thing. Yeah, no, that's a really great question. So one of the things that I try to do with faculty that are, that are, are a little um, hesitant about games or using games 
is I'll, I'll do two approaches depending on the mindset of the faculty member. So one is there's actually a lot of research out there and a lot of examples of using games for learning. So one of the, you know, people say, well, my subject's too serious for games, right? Well, guess who uses games the most? Military and medical education. I don't think there's much more serious than deciding to shoot somebody or trying to save somebody's life. So I kind of give those examples. And the Crimson Contagion example is a tabletop exercise used by the federal government to um, gameplay what would happen with pandemics. So I talk about that series. The other thing that I have tried to do and have had some success with is I've brought them in and we've played a game. So it's not really an activity. I, I, sometimes I don't even call it a game. I call it an activity and I get them involved. And then all of a sudden I say, oh, by the way, you know, we're, we're playing a game. And sometimes they're like, wow, that's really kind of interesting or really I, I've learned a lot. So sometimes that visceral experience of doing it yourself or sometimes that rational, here's kind of how, how games work. One of the things that I, I and then I, I, I think the problem oftentimes is in terms of fun games and, and just games is there's not enough modeling. So if you think of someone who's gotten their PhD and they're a faculty member, they or, or whatever degree, depending where they're teaching, is that um, they're good, we're good at studying, at being serious, at you know getting to the end point in terms of literature reviews and all that kind of stuff. And not a lot of our academic experience has been learning games. So modeling and showing them how learning games can be fun and not boring, how they're not just multiple choice questions with points, how it's not just, oh, you get a badge and you get a badge and you get a badge, but you show, look, there, here's the critical thinking that takes place in order for the students to make this decision. Here's the example of where your subject matter ex expertise is applied to this game situation, like in history and those kind of things. So those are a few, a few areas that I try to stress, but I think having the faculty play the game or play a learning game that you know is effective works really well. So um, those are some ideas. Great, great questions. Is that helpful? Yeah. In general terms, we're, we, whenever you work with a faculty member, you're always looking for specific tricks that will always uh, uh, get you past that particular challenge. Again, I'm talking in game mechanics here, but that's how I tend to look at life sometimes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great, I used to call, you know, they're not games, they're genuine, authentic memory enhancement systems. And so sometimes. <laughs> nice to Very yeah, right. Well, right, yes, yes. Um, but, it, but it's funny because, uh, uh, you know, there's some really interesting research uh, a number of places about active learning and, and versus uh, just pure lectures and how active learning again and again trumps just dumping of information. Uh, but the model is pretty uh, comfortable with dumping information. So um, sometimes I have to make them crawl before they can walk. So let's just just let's just use an audience response system. We'll just ask a couple questions, right? And what's in it for you as a faculty member? Well, it automatically takes attendance. Okay, so let's just go ahead and do that. Okay, now that you've asked a couple questions, why don't we integrate them as decisions in a scenario? Okay, so now let's ask your students to make a decision about that. Oh, okay, yeah, that, that wasn't so bad, you know. And so um, the great thing I think about teaching sometimes is is it's kind of like Groundhog Day, right? The, every year you're teaching the same thing or close to the same thing. So I say to the faculty, this year let's just try this and this, get comfortable with it, and then we'll go for And oftentimes they get very excited about that, and then it's easier to go to the next step. Good advice. Thank you. And thank you, Dan. Yeah, thank you. I hope you're enjoying spring in Alaska. We are. <laughs> uh, friends, if you're, if you're new to the forum, you can see this is how it works. We have questions by video and questions uh, via the Q&A box. And uh, that's how we proceed. Now, I'm saying this to encourage people to ask questions, but there's already a torrent of questions coming up. So I'm just going to turn to those really quickly. Uh, we have Neil Fung. Welcome back, Neil. Uh, Neil has a question about his undergraduate studies, I don't remember any educational games used. What is the current prevalence of games in higher education? Oh, uh, that's a great question. First of all, I'm sorry to hear that, Neil, but it's probably not um, unusual. There's not a ton, there's not a ton of games. So 
uh, one of the, the schools that, again, interestingly, one of the schools that use a lot of games are business schools, right? You play through running a business or operating a business or going through that. So, so that is becoming more and more prevalent, but, but it goes in phases. So for example, in the 1970s, there was actually a book called Serious Games. In the 1970s, that was the title of the uh, book by a guy named Clark Abetz, A-B-T. And before that, I, I, I bought a bunch of uh, game books from like the late 60s. And one of the books says, one of the problems is you walk into every corporate CEO's office and they're playing games. I'm like, <laughs> not anymore. Like, what happened? Um, and, what, and, and a lot of colleges were doing that as well. But what happened was... Uh, in the early 80s, late 70s, there was a move, cultural movement toward more conservative, you know, no child left behind and all that kind of stuff. And it even hit the, the college. And so there's less and less games there. And now it's starting to resurge more with video, uh, video games. But um, so I would say uh, um, less than probably five or 10% of all college classrooms across the country are using any kind of learning game, but um, uh, there are lots of opportunities to do that. And lots of, it doesn't have to be a full fledged game. So mm -hmm. you could add game elements without having to construct a huge game. So you could have things like um, let's, and, and it's much, much better to do it. Like some audience response system has leaderboards, but it's much mm -hmm. better to do it in teams because then the students don't want to let down the rest of the team. So they'll answer questions team wise, where, you know, if they're answering questions by themselves, they may be like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to, but any game, if you can think of, of where you can add some strategy, somebody mentioned, I think war, war gaming, um, mm -hmm. somewhere. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're definitely, uh, strategy games thinking mm -hmm. about the first, for example, the first corporate game was in 1930 in a typewriter factory in Russia. Uh, before that time, they had no typewriter factories in Russia and they were trying to get people up to speed on how do you run a factory? So uh, the, a woman named Mary Burstein created a game to teach people how to run the factory, but you could teach in social work. How, how do you run a city, right? You use SimCity. The other thing that you can use is you don't have to develop a game or use a learning game use a game like SimCity and then talk about the lessons, right? Uh, use a game like, you know, this is an easy low hanging fruit, but you could take um, pandemic and we could talk about what's it like to live through a pandemic and what's it mean to be in a pandemic and, you know, all that kind of stuff. In fact, there's one game called uh, pandemic, I think, or not pandemic plague plague, I think. Mm -hmm. And, and they said, and some of research, I said, when, whenever there's a pandemic, like SARS or whatever, mm -hmm. playing of their game increases by 300% because mm -hmm. people want to make sense of what they're going through. And that game's interesting because you play as the virus or as yeah. the bacteria and yeah. you're trying to uh, affect, infect as many people as you can. So, you know, it's kind of flipping it on its head, which is kind of interesting. Oh, it is. That is. That's a great game. And I'm, I'm glad to hear you mentioned Burstein. That's a, the Soviet origin of this is fascinating to me. Isn't it? I think it's wonderful, yeah. We have a, a couple of quick comments from the chat. Uh, um, people are talking about uh, games versus the uh, high stakes testing regime. That's very important. Uh, and then Andrew Peterson notes, uh, game-based curriculum seems to be adopted by individual faculty members, not by departments or colleges, which would, I think, help. That's a great them. insight, yeah. Uh, Neil, that's a great question, a great question. Speaking of questions, we have another video question from Julie Slade at Chatham University. Let's bring her up to the stage. Hello, Julie. Thank you. And this is my first Future Trends Forum to attend, so thank Welcome. you so much. This is so interesting to me. And Cap, thank you for all that you're sharing. Um, I actually wanted to share a resource, a plug, whatever you might call it. I am part of a group, it's uh, called Professors at Play. If you've never heard of it, it's a new grassroots group that's going on that really looks at all of this. Um, so I just wanted to share that in case anybody in attendance has never heard of it. We're always looking for members. Um, and I myself am back in school when you say about the PhD. Um, I have a doctorate in uh, nursing practice, so a DNP, and I'm back into a PhD program myself. 
And for my study, I am looking at um, in incorporating play, fun, and games into higher education. Um, so I want to study um, professors' um, perception of bringing play, fun, and games into higher education. So I'm hearing you talk about games, and it's amazing, and I love what you're saying. Do you have any advice on play and how to incorporate play into higher education as opposed to gaming? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So first of all, my, my mother and my grandmother both graduated from Chatham. Really? Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah I'm in Pittsburgh. And my grandmother actually worked with Rachel Carson. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, yeah. I never got to meet Rachel, but that kind of cool. So uh, anyway, so, so if you think about the difference between games and play is I usually use the definition where play doesn't have an objective. Right. So game has an objective. As soon as, like I always say, two kids splashing around in the pool, that's playing. As soon as you say, I'll race you to the other side of the pool, now it's a game, right? Because you've got rules. If I get out of the pool and run, you say I'm cheating, even though we never even said rules. So um, I think we learn an awful lot from exploration. And I like to look at how do kids learn? Well, kids learn through play. And one of the most interesting things to me is, you know, kids will go to school all day and they'll even tell you they're bored at school or whatever, but then they'll come home and they'll play school and one will be a teacher. Why is that? Well, it's sense making. So I think play is a way of allowing people to make sense of the world around them. But what we need to do in order to allow that to happen is a safe, um, open world to play in. Mm. So, for example, uh, you need to bring in elements that they they can add to their classroom and allow them to play and then extract um, ideas out of that play. And so I think a lot of faculty, some faculty are, are a little reluctant to allow an unstructured chaotic activity to occur in their classroom. Uh, if somebody walks by, if somebody sees it, if something's going on, it doesn't look like it. And the students are like, well, what am I actually learning here? And so to provide that, I believe that I actually believe that there's no learning without reflection. There's only experience. So if we don't provide reflection and we don't know how to give that reflection or debrief or action, action after action review or whatever after play, then people become reluctant to use the, that, that um, element. So I think one of the things that would be interesting to, to study or to think about is the professors that decide to have play in their classroom, not just games, but play, well, why, how, what is their thought process versus someone who allows games versus someone who doesn't allow that kind of thing in the classroom. I think that's really kind of, kind of interesting. Yeah, so I wish you the best of luck with that. And thanks for letting me know about the professors of play. That's a great, uh, sounds like a great group. It is a great group, and please join. We love to have yeah. people like you involved. Now, where are you find out more information about that? Um, Brian actually shared in the chat, Professors ah, of Play. Okay. Work. And uh, on Twitter, I shared out the uh, link as well as the uh, Twitter handle. Oh, great. And, and Julie, um, whoever uh, runs your Twitter account um, did a very, very sweet tweet about a late dear friend of mine, Bernie DeCohen, and that meant a lot to me. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Julie, for the question, and welcome to the forum. Um, we have uh, more and more comments and more questions just coming in all over the place. So I'm going um, it, to, it's a world which is fantastic. Uh, clearly, Carl, you're, you're just right here in the middle of the, of the torrent, not just a torrent, but a torrent. Uh, we have another great question from David Hull, uh, who asks, if you could dive into the intersection of gaming and equitable access to technology. <laughs> yeah. That's a great question. So, wow. So there's unfortunately not as many good tools as there should be for accessibility. So, you know, when we think of accessibility, there's a lot of things to think about with technology. So my first response in terms of accessibility is uh, folks who have um, uh, hearing or vision uh, elements that they need to deal with that are not conducive in a computer environment or a virtual environment. Um, games are not overly good at that. Uh, games, uh, there's some tools out there, but they're not as effective as they could be. 
Now, there's some clever people that have de developed entire games based on sound, which work really well for some people. Mm. Uh, some on, on sites a little bit easier in terms of games. That That's a whole accessibility issue. There's not, unfortunately, like an easy button like there is with staples for that kind of stuff. Um, accessibility that way is tough. In terms of the digital divide, which is another view of accessibility, um, I think colleges, many colleges that I've been involved with have not done as good a job as they could have of giving technology to the students as part of their entry into the uh, institution. Some organizations do it really, really well and some don't, but it's not across the board. And it doesn't mean that just because you have access and you go home, that you have good internet at home if you're not in your dorm. Um, some schools are, are community. So that's still an issue. Um, but one of the things that I was really into before the pandemic is there's a huge resurgence in card and board games. Um, in I think 2019, there was 5,000 new board games created, which is just awesome. Now, I have to think not all 5,000 were probably as good as maybe we had hoped, but still, that's, that's, that's a lot, right? And um, I saw a documentary one time on Johnny Cash, and it said, Anybody who wrote as many songs as Johnny Cash would have a hit just from a pure statistical perspective. Mm -hmm. So if we have 5,000 games, we're probably going to have hits just from a pure statistical perspective. So uh, we don't always have to use technology for games. And when we can get back together after this pandemic thing, I think using uh, digital di uh, uh, analog games in the classroom can do a lot. And someone had mentioned before having I mean, students create their own games. So uh, uh, Tiagi, who's a, a well-known uh, person in game design, has a concept that he calls frame games. So a frame game is um, the content changes, but the gameplay stays the same, basically. So I think one of the things that we could do as faculty is create uh, frames. So, for example, you could take the Cards Against Humanity frame and have people come up with, you know, more like apples to apples, which is less contentious or less controversial than uh, Cards Against Humanity, and uh, have the students come up with the content, have the students come up with even new rules to play the games and even new ways to play the games. So I think that's kind of a wonderful way to do that as well. So uh, those are some, some uh, good thoughts to think about games. So they don't have to be technology to be accessible. They can be analog and board games. And there's places like Print and Play, The Game Crafter, who, who for very inexpensively, you could take your game idea or your student's game idea and just put that into a printed final version that looks and feels like a real commercial version. And uh, sometimes just having that is fun. And card games are great to develop because you could just buy a deck of um, index cards, and just yeah. write on the index cards, figure out if the game works there, prototype it, and then once you perfect it, then you can print it. So lots of options that, you know, 20 years ago weren't of it. I mean, to have a card game printed was cost prohibitive, but now you, you know, for 20 bucks, you can get it printed and sent to your house. Well, you, you've hit a, not just a torrent, but a nerve here in the chat. We've got people talking about exploding kittens, which I also like. Yeah. Um, Roxanne is a big fan of apples to apples. I think she was going to say it's her jam, but the pun would be too crazy. Um, <laughs> And uh, I'm just throwing in the chat here um, um, uh, a card game that I've used in my work uh, called The Thing from the Future, which is a, uh, a card game to get people thinking about uh, different futures, which is a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. Um, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Carl, for that great answer. Um, this is uh, becoming more and more inspiring uh, as we go. Uh, Jesse Kemp has uh, a whole series of questions, and I want to bring up uh, the first of them, um, which is... Uh, which assessment method do you recommend for gamification that demonstrates an ROI or you know, return on investment and also learning objectives being met? Good yeah. question, Jesse. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, a couple of things. One, I'll put, I have a game, Zombie, uh, a card game, uh, Zombie Instructional Design Apocalypse. So if you're an instructional designer, you can check out that game. Yes. Uh, but uh, it's a scenario-based game. But... Uh, the question about how do you assess 
using gamification. So I, I actually divide gamification into three different buckets. So one is I call it structural gamification. That's where you add game elements around content, but you don't change the content itself. So you answer a multiple choice question, you get five points. You watch a video, you get 10 points. You So in that particular case, typical traditional assessments, because it's traditional content, tend to be what's used a lot uh, in terms of recall, in terms of retention, those kind of things. The second type of gamification I call uh, content gamification, where you change the content itself to be a little bit more game-like. And a real good example of this um, is, is combining with the concept called desirable difficulty. So mm. Warwick and some others have found out that the easier it is for us to learn something, the harder it is for us to recall it later on. So a little bit of desirable difficulty, a little bit of struggle is good for retention because we have to work through it in a different way. And they even said, like when I was growing up, everybody said, well, Carl, when you study, you have to be at the same desk all the time and it has to be totally quiet. You have to be focused. It turns out that's really good for passing the test the next day. It's really horrible for remembering it the next week. The reason is because we need to have struggles so we encode it more deeply than just enough for a test. We've all, I guarantee everybody in this session has crammed for a test and has passed the test. And then four weeks later, doesn't remember anything that's on the test. So games can give you that, that sense of desirable difficulty and struggle that we can then measure later on in content gamification. So I think content gamification, you want to do, uh, you want to measure the ability of the person to make a decision, the ability of the person to transfer that knowledge from one situation to another situation, the uh, ability of that person to generalize that information. Those are all, I think, really good ways to assess the effectiveness of that content gamification. The third type of gamification, which really isn't used that much in academia, but is used a lot in organizations, is what I call performance-based gamification, where, and this is why, because your, your job, let's say checking credit, is gamified. So you're supposed to check the credit of customers. Every time you check the credit of customers, you get five points. Every time you don't, you lose five points. So of course you check it every time and it's built into the systems that you use every day. Um, I'm not saying necessarily that's a good thing. I'm just saying it's a type of gamification. So those are some ways to think about um, answering some of those kinds of assessment questions. Oh, that's terrific. What a primer on this. Uh, I think that's, uh, again, a really, really good question. Um, it was a really good question. Uh, now we have uh, more questions coming in, and uh, I'm conscious of time. I want to make sure everyone gets a gets a crack at them. Uh, and this is one coming from uh, Olgi Gary. And Olgi, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, please uh, don't uh, let, let me know. Um, and and this is a question. Uh, in fact, it's a video question, so I'm going to bring her up on stage. Oh, perfect. Um, and this is a question about intercultural games. Um, Olgi, are you are you connected to my friend Jay Gary? <laughs> and we saw the half. <laughs> for many, many, many years. <laughs> Please tell them hi from me. <laughs> We're celebrating one more anniversary, I guess, at the end, in a couple of weeks. Happy anniversary. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, yes. My question, and this is excellent. I'm glad you're recording it and also the chat because you're putting a lot of resources in there. Mm -hmm. But my question is, um, what about well-established intercultural role-playing learning games such as Bafa Bafa? What is the process if one wanted to bring that kind of game online into the digital age? I put out a game about some 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. We stopped counting uh, over when over 500,000 people had played it. It was used by training agencies um, in different parts of the world. But we, we, I get requests for that game all the time, but packaging it it's it's not an easy thing. Like my father ha has so many little pieces. Mm -hmm. Is there a, is there a, some pointers you can give me or places you can send me that I can repackage that and put it out? The Luna game and also the Campe game, both of them widely used. Um, and I get requests all the time. And you know, I just say, hold on, we're trying. Yeah, that's a good question. So. Um, 
I wish I had an easy answer for you to say, yes, all you need to do is such and such and such and such. There are a number of tools that can be very helpful for creating games. You need someone who's a little bit of a design sense. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I always say about my students who wanted to develop digital games is let's do a paper prototype first. And then one of the comments I got one time was, Dr. Cop, really paper? Why do we have to do paper? Well, once you do a paper game and you verify that it works on paper, then putting it digitally makes it much, much easier. So um, you can then team with somebody who knows how to use a tool like Construct 3 is a really good tool. Game Salad is a really good tool. Those are very simple game development tools that you could use to create uh, your games. Okay. Um, some games, if they're simple, like a card game, sometimes you can use Articulate or Storyline, which are, are uh, tools as well. But um, I think that um, using something like Construct 3, who has a huge community, they have uh, lots of tutorials, they have, it's easier to use than, like if you've ever opened up Unity, I always liken it to the cockpit of a 737. I'm like, how do I even? But Construct 3 is, is much easier and simple to use. Um, mm -hmm. There's a branching story. Muzzy Lane has a branching tool, depending on if the game branches. Um, so there are some ways. I would say um, team up with either the game design folks or game development folks at your university or a nearby university or computer science folks and give them a game development platform and um, you can work with them to, to get that kind of game online. Okay. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, I see, I see the thing about uh, I, <laughs> Ian's gamification is BS um, question. Uh, you know, that I, I, I just don't agree with that. And, and when gamification first came out, there was a group of game designers who basically said, how dare anyone else in the world create games? How dare they? Because we are the holders of the secret crest of game creation and no one else, especially these learning people, know anything about creating games. My counter argument is learning people know a lot more about how to get learning out of people, how to design learning, how to develop learning how to make learning effective, and why can't we use elements from games? So for example, points, uh, you know, points badges and leaderboards are often held up as the evil trifecta of gamification. And there is some truth to just willy nilly throwing points at some, oh, 10 points for Gryffindor, you know, that doesn't mean anything. Cool. But if points give you feedback on how correct you are, you know, a scale of one to 10 and you only get a five, you know, you only did half as good as you could do. So that element of points can give you insight into the accuracy of your responses. A leaderboard works well for teams, not so well for individuals. So gamification, when properly applied, can be a very effective tool. Gamification, when improperly applied, can be a horrible tool. But guess what? So can lectures. Guess what? So can video. Guess what? So can discussions. Anything. So it, yeah, it's not inherently bad because it's gamification. Bad gamification is bad gamification, but bad lectures are bad lectures. So um, I, I did not agree with, with, with him. I, I actually, we presented together at, at a conference. And so we had, um, it was very cordial, but we had a discussion of <laughs> our frames of reference. Um, it's not altogether wrong, but uh, 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 I'm not altogether right, so <laughs> there's, there's a compromise in the middle. Well, I pre I appreciate that, and uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to your next book on gamification to see how you, uh, um, you know, uh, how uh, how this accounts for it. Um, we are also just a, a one thing, just a, a look ahead a little bit uh, along these themes. Um, we have a uh, session coming up on June 17th um, about a card game based on getting people to have conversations about emerging technology and education. Uh, so we're going to play a couple of uh, rounds of it here in the forum. Uh, the game's called What the Deck, uh, and, um, and you know, there'll be more information about it coming up, but just a little ahead. Yeah.
Uh, more questions. Oh my gosh, questions are just all over the place. I don't think we can get to all of them, so I'm going to try and get uh, to um, as the, re the highlights um, as quickly as we can. One from uh, our longtime uh, friend and supporter of the program, Tom Haynes, asks about uh, what are some key principles of gamification that you would see to gaming out an entire semester of instruction uh, as opposed to a game unit within a class? Yeah, so that's a really interesting. So um, I think I think it's very close to um, problem in some ways problem based learning. So the course I described before is uh, the students who I put into teams are competing against one another. So I've kind of gamified the semester. I give them roles, you know, or, or I have them assign their own roles as who's going to be the project manager, who's going to be the instructional designer, who's going to be the graphics person, and then they uh, take on the role of prototype development. So um, what I would say is, if you can, and this is the capstone class, but it's funny because people say, well, you could do that, you know, Dr. Cobb, because you're uh, uh, teaching graduate school in this capstone class. Well, one of my graduates actually who teaches sixth grade did the same thing. He di divides his sixth grade students into teams and they have to come up with a solution to an environmental problem and they present it to people from the community. Um, which is just a wonderful, brilliant application of that whole concept. So, so the, the course, and I inherited, I didn't develop that course, um, is a frame in which you can add different content. So, for example, no matter what you're teaching, is there groups that compete against each other in your field? Mm -hmm. And can you then give them a project for your class that they have to work toward to do that? And I've seen, and that works really well. I've seen uh, gamification where uh, instead of earning points for things, you start out with experience points and then everything you do, you either lose or gain experience points. So that's a way to do it throughout the whole semester. I think the, 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 the important thing, especially when you're, you're teaching college age uh, students is to frame the gamified experience into something that's as authentic as possible. So competing against another team for a proposal. That's what happens in our industry. Competing for, for example, one archaeological dig against another for resources, having students write uh, grants, grant proposals, all those kind of things can be done, I think, in an authentic kind of environment. The, the last thing I want to say about gamification is gamification is using game elements, but it doesn't necessarily need to feel like a game. So for example, progress bars. Uh, when LinkedIn, way back when, put a progress bar on their um, uh, profiles, it increased the completion of profiles by something like 50%. Mm. Now, now, people wouldn't say LinkedIn is a game, mm -hmm. but that one element of showing progress made it more. So, so really, I have another colleague who says gamification is just a bunch of psychological, motivational elements mm -hmm. that are applied properly. And so so don't think that it all has to be, you know, oh, fun. Like in my class where I divide students into teams, every semester I have a team of students who do not like each other. And I have to, you know, get involved and kind of mediate as yeah. part of the process. So they're not having fun. They're not enjoying that. Um, uh, and we try to teach them how, hopefully, how to work together and how to work out these conflicts. But that's part of the process. So don't expect or don't – your end goal should not be – fun and laughing and just giggling if you want to do that give them you know that give them a day off but if you want them to learn then use these elements to motivate them for certain outcomes well that was a fantastic answer um to a really really great question well, thank you thank you um and just really quickly uh uh Shahri Dad, um, uh, from Indiana University, want us to uh, share this. Um, uh, they're doing a free online teach, play, learn conference on June 25th. Um, so, and I'll share that uh, URL in the chat as well. Uh, that sounds like a lot of fun, Jeremy. Thank you. It does sound like fun. Uh, we had a couple of more questions building up in gamification. Um, and uh, one of them comes from Danette at Northern State University, uh, who asks if you could distinguish between structural and performance based gamification. Uh, it seems the examples were pretty similar. Yeah, so um, that's a good question. So structural gamification is most often around um, content 
teaching, learning. Performance is tied to on the job activities. So that's the difference. So, so for example, the, the program would be, would be programmed into, you know, if you were, if you were a customer service rep, it would be programmed into your telephone. So if you went over your one minute that you're allowed to interact with the customer, you would lose points. Where structural gamification is more, there's a structure around content that already exists and you're learning, but it doesn't actually have to do with what's on the job. That, that's the kind of distinction. That, that's a good question, yeah. Uh, it's a great question. Um, and uh, uh, and that, uh, I'm sorry, Dunnett, let us know if, uh, if you need to go further. Um, we have an incredibly precise research question from Andrew Peterson, who wants to know what Batman comic is framed. <laughs> so first of all, let me say that it is not authentic. My son bought it for me on the streets of New York. So I can almost guarantee it's yeah. not real, <laughs> but it's Batman. I think it's Batman number one. Uh, but he got it for me for my birthday several years ago. But but it's just a replica. It's not it's not unfortunately the real thing. <laughs> had to get that. Had to get That's that. That's a great question. Yes, I get asked that quite frequently. And I, the first time I'm like, "What Batman? I don't even remember." And then I'm like, "Oh yeah, it's right behind me." That's very good. So, yeah, we have we have seven minutes to go, which is which is just crazy. I can't believe we're this far alone. But I I want to make sure we get some more of these questions coming up. Uh, Penelope Moon at the University of Washington Bethel asks. She loves your LinkedIn classes. Some faculty look down on extrinsically motivating learners. Well, that's a big part of games. How do you engage faculty on this? Well, hold on to that thought because several other people have been asking a related question. Um, in fact, last uh, uh, Mathieu Plourd uh, points out that last week's guest, or two weeks ago, uh, Alfie Cohn said uh, any point system is bad for learning. <laughs> so, so there's that, there's that, really? yeah, yeah. So there's opposition yeah. to, uh, to using points. Yeah. Uh, good, good question. What, what do you, and Matthew, what do you think? What do you think? So, so this is fascinating to me. So first of all, early on, someone said, you can't gamify school. That's not bad. Don't gamify school. I got bad news for you. School's already gamified, right? Okay. Doing a spelling test and getting points for the spelling test. That's a game. Going from level freshman to sophomore, that's leveling up. Getting a letter grade, that's a badge. So we've already gamified school. So that ship has sailed. Um, in terms of extrinsic motivation, some of the early, early tests that measure extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation, the instruments themselves were created so that the respondent could not indicate that they were extrinsically and intrinsically motivated at the same time. It was a, it was a false dichotomy. You had to be one or the other. Hmm. In almost every situation, people are both intrinsically and extrinsically motivated. So let's, uh, Julie, for example, wants to get her PhD, right? Well, you might uh, get a better job. That's extrinsic motivation, but you're also interested in the subject matter. That's intrinsic motivation. So you're motivated by both. What I say to, uh, but let's say that people still don't like this, the, the point system and all that kind of stuff, because if you're purely extrinsic motivation, it doesn't work. You kind of have a, like a little bit of both. Don't use those elements. Use the elements of story. Use the elements of progress. I call this deep gamification. Use, it, the, yeah. use the elements of progress. Use the elements of feedback loop. Use the elements of overcoming consequences use the elements of making decisions, use the elements of prioritization. So there's a lot of elements in games that have nothing to do with points, badges, or leaderboards. In fact, no one plays a game just for the points. There's a, there's a really um, interesting site um, that all it is is a, is a button, and every time you press it, you get points. That's Cow Clicker, isn't it? Yes, Cow Clicker, yes, yes. Great. In Great. Yes, I couldn't think of the name. But, and it's got really clever little stories, but, but it becomes maddening after a while because the other elements of games, like cooperation, competition, outwitting an opponent. So don't think of games as these extrinsic elements. Think of the deeper elements of games that motivate you to play them. Problem solving, uh, uh, alternative, thinking about alternatives, overcoming challenges, weaving and creating a story, use all those elements from games 
rather than the points, badges, and leaderboards. And that's what content gamification is all about. Just Thanks, a great question. It is. A, a quick question. Uh, Mark Colbert Wilson and, and another person I've just missed said, uh, what are the elements called for deep gamification? Well, okay. Um, I call them, I'm sorry, what was the question? I was reading what, the chat. What are the, what are the elements called for deep gamification? Or is deep gamification the, the phrase that addresses I, 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 That's the phrase that I've been using called deep gamification. I think I've seen it on the, in the research. Sometimes call it, some people call it gameful. Uh, um, Sebastian Dieterding calls it uh, gameful design. Mm. So that's another way to think about it as, as gameful design. So that, those are some ways to, to take a look at it. Yeah, it's interesting, Tom. I've also seen, he talks about uh, uh, some of the studies, but I've actually seen some studies that contradict that, that says that um, extrinsic motivation actually can lead to intrinsic motivation. Eventually, people become intrinsically motivated and setting some of the limits with extrinsic motivation actually drive creativity. So um, there's a lot of real, I went to a, a conference one time and, and it was a bunch of researchers about gamification. They said, and this is like a few years ago, they said, well, when will we know if gamification works and blah, blah, blah. And they said, well, in about 50 years when we have enough research uh, and enough body of knowledge to know. So I would say we're still working through some of this stuff and we don't know for sure, but uh, there is uh, elements on both sides. Well, that's, thank you um, um, for, for pressing on that a little further. And thank you, Mark, um, as always. I always learn something when Mark asks a question. Uh, we have time for one quick last question. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a big question, too. Um, and this is a, but it's a really good one. I want to make sure that we get this. This is uh, from Kay Hampshire at Dallas College. She says, her organization is pushing the need to develop online courses quickly, i.e. five weeks. Does this mean development of games is not possible? Or how complex are the games you develop? Right. So uh, great questions. Um, so, for example, my uh, frame of students being broken into teams. Uh, I did that this semester um, online, and you could do that as well. What's the subject matter? What, what can they write or work on together as a team? Is there an element of judgment? All of that thing can be part of it. Um, I also have started to use um, digital tools, which are the frameworks already created. So for example, I use Poll Everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, I use Pull Everywhere in part of a story. And at certain elements of the story, I ask the students, is it this or this? And then when they answer, I can see right away if the students are getting it, the right answer, or not getting it. Uh, a very simple uh, tool and question and answer. And I, I don't think you need technology for gamification. I think what you need is, is uh, creative design. And I think using the elements of story using the elements of character, using the elements of um, solving a problem are all game elements that you can integrate into it without taking a long time to develop. Usually it takes a little bit longer to, to develop, um, but not dramatically. And the results are usually much more powerful because one of the things that games do really well is they tap into our emotions. And so if you can uh, tap into a strong emotion, you can help with recall and help with, with the learning process. These are all great. Each of these questions are great questions. Each of these questions are almost like an entire lecture of my courses. So I feel like I'm like sprinting through the, the, the content and questions, but these are great, very deep questions. So I'm really enjoying this. Well, I appreciate both your answer to that question as well as your comment overall, because we are, I'm afraid, out of time. Um, this has been a, a terrific, terrific conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm just delighted at your enthusiasm, Carl, but also the depth of knowledge and your ability to answer questions with incredible concision. And uh, my, my hat's off to uh, my forum colleagues for wonderful, wonderful questions. Uh, just really, really quickly, Carl, um, how can we keep up with you? Is it uh, is it best to follow your uh, your blog if, if if that takes off again, or should we follow you on Twitter or how? So probably the best place is Twitter because I put a lot of date, uh, information there, but also uh, LinkedIn. Um, I have a newsletter on LinkedIn called L and D Easter Eggs. Mm. Uh, if you follow or subscribe to that, um, you'll get the latest and greatest on on my thinking and links to other things that that I'm doing. Um, 
so that's a, that's a great place to follow me. And then um, if you're on uh, YouTube, uh, follow the unauthorized, unofficial series or unofficial unauthorized series that way. But I usually then tweet about all this stuff on Twitter. So if you only want to follow me in one place, uh, Twitter would be the place. Okay, great. Um, and uh, Roxanne just just shared uh, your handle, which is KCap, um, in the in the in uh, the chat. Carl, thank you again. This has been terrific uh, and very inspiring. Um, I really appreciate it. And we're gonna have to bring you back um, uh, to follow up on this. That'd be great, yeah. Now, thanks everybody. Great questions, great insights. And uh, I learned a lot too. So uh, perfect. Uh, hope you enjoy that, yes. Take care and good luck with the, pro with the book project. We'll talk All to right. you. All right, thanks. Yep, take care. But don't go away, friends. Uh, just a couple of points about where we're headed next. Um, first, uh, again, thank you all for the great, great questions and thoughts. Uh, this has been fantastic. Uh, looking ahead, uh, again, um, we have a whole series of sessions coming up covering related and very different topics, everything from technology and academia to sparking emerging ed tech conversations with a game to federal policy changes, improving education equity for black students and more. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us uh, to learn more. Uh, if you would like to um, look back, if you want to keep talking about these issues, uh, we have a lot of conversation that goes on on Twitter using the hashtag FTTE, uh, but we also have spaces in LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, if you'd like to go back into the past and look at some of our previous sessions where we explore gaming and learning, we've been doing that since the beginning, just head to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. There's almost 260 videos there right now. And that's it for right now. Uh, thank you again for a great conversation. Everybody else, love to hear your thoughts about gaming. Uh, I'll quickly whip up a blog post about your comments, links, and unasked uh, questions that came up today. Uh, please go ahead and be gameful. Uh, and above all, be safe. Uh, we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>